So here's what we're going to cover today. Uh, just a basic overview of the storage industry, again, from the acquisitions perspective. So we'll share some facts and figures, but we're not going to go into super detail on every little thing. You can Google some of that information. We'll talk about the types of self-storage uh, that's out there. And then I'll give you my perspective on the pros and the cons of self-storage investing, just based on some of my own personal experience. So uh, let's jump in. And then at the end, we'll have some Q&A as well. If you guys have any questions, uh, we will get to those in the end. You can pop those in the chat or obviously the Q&A tab um, as well. All right, let's keep moving. So overview, uh, let's see. Just the general overview, again, from the acquisitions perspective, there's a lot of information out there. You can go get the self-storage almanac or uh, Sparefoot. They have a blog. Uh, Sparefoot is like the um, Expedia or Priceline of self-storage. And they have a blog where it has a bunch of facts and figures on there. But for our purposes, there are roughly, call it 51,000 self-storage facilities in the U.S. Uh, so this is not including Canada. Uh, but in the U.S. and roughly call it, I think it's 2 billion square feet. There's some fact out there or something like that. If like you add up all the McDonald's and some of the fast food, um, Starbucks and all that, they would uh, not equal the amount of square footage there is in self-storage. So there's a lot, even though we don't often think about it. Roughly uh, over half of those are owned, 60% or so are owned by the top 100 operators. So if you think of at the very top, there's the REITs like public storage, extra space, uh, Cube Smart, etc. They own the most, of course, as far as square footage is concerned, not based upon location. Um, so as far as square footage, so take that two billion or whatever the exact number is, and they own roughly sixty percent of that square footage. Uh, and then the top, after that, besides the REITs, the rest of the top one hundred operators, they own roughly sixty percent of the square footage out there. The remainder is owned by roughly forty percent of people, individuals, smaller companies, et cetera. Uh, maybe like Charlie here. Um, I wouldn't consider him mom and pop. He's closing on another 500 units here pretty soon. He's in the webinar. Uh, some of you guys are joining us a little bit late. I asked, uh, does anybody own any right now or are trying to get into the business? So Charlie raised his hand and said, hey, I own a few and I'm closing on some more. So the rest of everybody else, 40% are like Charlie, kind of like passiveinvesting.com. We did crack the top 100, but um, we're like 94 or something like that. So I wouldn't uh, think that's a huge deal. The point is, is that that 40% of square footage, not, not actual locations, but 40% of square footage represents the opportunity within self-storage. If I pivot real quick and talk about multifamily, it's basically the opposite in multifamily. Uh, I'll add this one fact as well. If you do it based upon location, not square footage. So the 60-40 split here that I have is based upon square foot. Uh, if you do it on actual locations, physical locations, uh, over half are actually owned uh, by what we might call mom and pop owners or people who own less than 10 locations. So maybe like two, and usually they own like one or two, maybe three, usually less than five locations. Uh, roughly 70-ish percent of the industry of locations are owned by people, individuals like that. They own one, two, three, maybe four locations. And really that's it. Um, so that's really the uh, opportunities within that space. If I had two pie charts up here, I would add that to the slides. I didn't have time to do it. But you would see that uh, the reason 60% of square footage is owned by the top 100 operators, and but 70-ish percent of locations are owned by mom and pops, what we call mom and pops. That said, that means that the larger facilities are owned by the top 100 operators and the smaller facilities are owned by the mom and pops. And usually when we're trying to do our own storage deal um, and just kind of set up ourselves for retirement, maybe but we want to own two, three, four locations. And really that's it. Maybe some of us have a bigger vision. You want to own a lot more. You want to build a big company, you know, whatever. The point is, is that there's a lot of opportunity as far as location is concerned to buy smaller deals if you're an individual investor and you just want to do a handful of deals. So all that to say, that's where the opportunity is. There's a lot more facts, figures, et cetera, out there. But uh, multifamily is the opposite of that. The majority are own of locations, multifamily locations are owned by uh, top investors, sophisticated groups, pension funds, et cetera. And there's very few opportunity within uh, multifamily compared to self-storage. So it's a bit of uh, the opposite. And I use multifamily because that is um, uh, an easy way for people to think about 
uh, the comparison between the two. The opportunity there. All right, so let's talk about the type. So that's really the opportunity. It's owned by mom and pops. We'll come back to that later in the presentation. That's an interesting uh, point there. Let's talk about the different types of storage and what you might be targeting uh, as you go and look for deals for yourself or looking to invest with people who are uh, active in the self-storage space. All right, what follows here are general guidelines. These are not hard and fast rules of self-storage, okay, and, and the different uh, types but we'll talk about class A, class B, and class C self-storage, all right? So first up, class A, of course, you've all seen, probably driving down the road, seen facilities that look like this Cube Smart here on your screen. Class A facilities are gonna be like this, usually multi-story, they're gonna be larger, so greater than 40,000, often greater than 50,000 uh, rentable square feet. They'll be climate controlled uh, the most of the time. You can have a mix of climate and non-climate at a class A facility, but usually they're the multi-story, climate controlled. If it's a mix of non-climate and climate, they'll usually have a big building that's climate and then some single-story buildings that are non-climate. The area, the drive aisles around those buildings will all be paved. There will be no gravel uh, there. Paved, I think, is paving is one of the best things you can do as an operator uh, for your facility, um, but that's a different topic. So, And usually the location is going to be what we call infill. So it's not going to be Generally speaking, not going to be on the outskirts or in the rural areas or even sometimes in suburban areas. They're going to be kind of not always main and main, but just in good locations. A lot of traffic, maybe 50,000 people within about a three-mile uh, radius around the property. You're going to have a lot of drive-by traffic, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50,000 cars a day. One location that we have has roughly 40,000 cars a day that drive right by it, so it's very busy. Um, so that's usually a class A facility. Again, guidelines, not hard and fast rules um, for this kind of stuff. All right. Class B is going to be usually larger to medium size. So call it maybe 50, 60,000 square feet down to roughly 30 to 40, you know, somewhere in that range. There'll be a mix of climate control, the non-climate units. So these are the non-climate units I'm talk I was talking about. And you can see the area around the units, the drive aisles. These are paved in this case. Uh, sometimes you might see gravel at some places. So the buildings will be you know, new or fairly new or just you know, nice, maybe freshly painted. But there'll be some gravel around it, and that's okay at a Class B facility. Um, there'll be multi-story or single-story. You could see a mix of both. Uh, like I mentioned, where you might have a multi-story a multi, -story class, uh, a multi -story climate control building, and then around it will be some non-climate buildings, maybe some nice covered parking, something like that. You'll, you'll see a mix of that. And then it might be infill. It might, need, might not be infill. It'll be definitely in a location that is busy, that's around some housing uh, potentially or some commercial, some retail, et cetera. But it's not necessarily going to be main and main, you know, in like a downtown Charlotte area or whatever. But it's going to be a good location. It's a growing area, maybe... 20 to not 20, but maybe 30 to 40,000 people in a three ish five mile radius, but it's got some growth in that area. Uh, usually, I didn't really talk about age, but not usually older than roughly call it 10, 15 years or so. Although that can be, again, it's a guideline. If you throw some paint on a metal, metal building, it looks brand new again. Um, so that's it, doesn't always have to be built within that, within that time frame. All right. And then we have class C. So, uh, and that's kind of what you see, obviously, here in the picture. In this case, the drive aisles around these buildings are um, paved, but uh, you might see some where they're all single story like this and it's gravel, and that's okay as well. Uh, they're going to be, generally speaking, medium to small size facilities. So when I talk about that location that they're owned by mom and pops, roughly 70% of locations are owned by mom and pops, roughly 40% of square footage is owned by mom and pops. So the, the REITs, like the Cube Smarts of the world, the top 100 operators, they usually own larger facilities. They just have fewer locations, so they have more square footage. The mom and pops, they have um, uh, maybe smaller square footage, but there's a lot more locations, just like this one. This is literally just three buildings with a fence and a gate around it, and I don't even think it's a... I'm not sure. I can't tell from the photos, but it might not be even a uh, mechanical fence. Uh, and I'm not sure where the office is either. But the point is, is that this is what you would generally see in a class C facility, usually non-climate controlled. It could be paved. It could be gravel. Usually it's going to be single story. I have seen some pretty bad, one in really bad shape in Atlanta that was a multi-story. Uh, it was unbelievable. It looked like a prison uh, when I toured it. I was like, I want to get, get out of this place. So anyway, um, uh, but yeah, and these are the ones that like some of us might have in mind. Uh, when I first worked at 10 Federal, 
uh, I, my background in storage at 10 Federal, it's a company that do self-storage and they do some multifamily uh, management. But um, uh, this is what we were targeting. So smaller, 30,000 square feet or less usually uh, in decent markets, but it could be a little bit more rural, a little bit more out, a little bit more suburban, uh, not necessarily infill. Uh, it could be graveled, could be paved either way, but it would be very simple buildings like this. Um, that we that we target maybe one to two million. I didn't put the purchase price numbers on here because those can vary, you know, kind of widely. But generally speaking, the uh, class B, class C, class C are definitely not going to be usually over like five million dollars for one of those kinds of locations, unless it's huge. Uh, but generally speaking, thirty thousand square feet is going to be less than five million dollars, maybe two million ish, three million ish, one million ish, less than that, a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, class B. You're going to kind of blend the the lines there, maybe five, six, four, five, six, three, four, five, six million up to 10 ish. Again, it just depends. Not hard and fast rules. And then class A is using to be much more expensive. That's because the building is nicer and it's in a little bit better of an area. And it's usually a newer um, uh, facility built in the last maybe five ish years or so. So most of us, you know, uh, we're not always going to be targeting that kind of stuff. If we're looking to just to kind of do our own deals, we might be targeting more class C, which again, that's really the opportunity. All right. Okay. So let's move on real quick and discuss the pros and cons of storage investing. Um, so we should be able to wrap this up in the next call at 15 minutes or so. We'll have some time for Q&A. If you have questions about what I've talked about so far or anything that's coming up here, uh, go ahead and pop those in the chat or the Q&A and we'll get to those here in just a minute. This is based, so these pros and cons are going to be based upon just my personal experience things I've seen in the industry. I've created this list uh, a while ago, actually, when Radius Plus first came out. I wrote an article, and it was one of the first articles that they put on Radius Plus. It might still be there. I don't know. Uh, but the pros and cons of self-storage investing. Um, and people I've seen, they've taken this list, they've added to it, uh, and I borrowed some of these ideas from back in the day. So you've probably seen something like this in the past. Uh, but just based upon uh, our experience that passing, uh, passing at Passive, uh, this is what we've kind of experienced in in just sharing it with you. So again, the fragmented ownership, hitting on that again, this is now the third time talking about it. This is a pro, right? There's an opportunity within the space. If you're targeting multifamily and you want to do it for yourself or just kind of start out, you might be buying, you know, 10, 15 units. Uh, you can take that same cash that it would take to buy 10, 15, 20, 30 units um, and buy 300 units in self-storage. So the, the ownership is fragmented and there's an opportunity within that space. Uh, we talked about that earlier on, but I think that's one of the great pros about this industry. And then one of the reasons why I got into it. Uh, next is lower expense ratios. So roughly for every dollar that you uh, bring in in revenue uh, at self in self-storage, roughly 30 cents to 40 cents of that goes to pay your expenses. And the remainder is left over as your net operating income before you pay any debt service. So uh, fewer things break and fewer things have to be fixed, in other words. And you have more money to cover those issues as they come up. That's not always like that, but it's, in other words, like you might have uh, some a few surprises, the gate breaks, et cetera. You should be putting, setting aside reserves to cover those uh, kind of emergency situations. So reserves are basically just an emergency fund. You set some aside to cover those bigger expenses. But really, it's very simple. The expense ratio is typically pretty low. If I compare it to multifamily, in multifamily, you might see a 50 to 60 um, percent expense ratio. It just depends on the size of the of the uh, property. In storage, again, if you get a larger facility, that expense ratio could be in the 20s, so 25-ish percent. If you have a smaller facility, you can get up there closer to 40 percent. So every 40, every dollar that comes in, roughly 40 cents covers your expenses. But generally speaking, the expense ratio is pretty darn low. Uh, no evictions in self-storage, which is really nice. Uh, my background is, is single family homes and multifamily. Uh, I got started in 07 doing single family home brokerage right around the recession at that time. Uh, and it was really bad. We had to do a lot of foreclosure work. I actually did evictions. I showed up with a sheriff's deputy and would evict people and change locks on homes. That was my really my first taste of real estate and I didn't like it at all. Uh, within storage, you don't have that problem. Uh, if somebody's trying to live in a unit that's illegal, it's against the law, it's not safe, it's not sanitary. So you get the police and they can come and remove them or you just tell them you got to pack up and leave. Um, and if somebody doesn't pay uh, in you know single family homes, multifamily rentals, you have to evict people and they might have a family. Maybe they fell in hard times. It's really hard uh, to do that. Back when I did it, I was single. I didn't have a family, wasn't married. I had no idea like the um, economic impact 
on people's lives that that foreclosures and all that had. I understand that maybe some people got they overstretched themselves, they bought too much house. I understand that people make mistakes, uh, but it was really heartbreaking to see some of that stuff. Whereas in storage, you're not dealing with that. And the emotional toll, you're just getting rid of stuff. You're just auctioning people's stuff. You're not you're not kicking people out. So in my opinion, some people may not care about that. In my opinion, that's a great part of uh, self-storage investing. And then also it's month to month. So I call it the Netflix. Somebody else said that too, I think, uh, but I call it the Netflix of, of real estate. It's month to month. So you can raise rates as, as needed. Uh, and that's take that with a grain of salt, right? So maybe somebody moves in. That's kind of the big story right now. So somebody moves in, uh, they get a really low introductory rate. Maybe it's you know half off or whatever it is. And then six months from now, you raise the rents and you may have a certain percentage that will move out anyway. But a lot of people, they just end up taking the rental rate increase and they stay uh, because they need the space for whatever reason. If you read the uh, results from the REITs, uh, they're having a very successful, um, that, that strategy is very successful for them. They're called ECRIs, existing customer uh, rate increases, ECRIs. Um, that's what they're doing in order to push revenue. So the street rates are very low. And that's what Yardi and these other data places, they track that information. So they scrape websites and they put together all the rental rating information and they see like, okay, rents are down in different markets. And that's going to be true, but we don't, we can't see what those uh, customer rental rate increases are because those are not public uh, knowledge. They're not public information. You can kind of backtrack and kind of back of the envelope, figure it out, but um, it's not public information. So, uh, but they're claiming that they're getting really good results from those ECRIs. Uh, the downside of that, we'll talk about that here on the next slide. All right. So the cons of self-storage investing, uh, it's popular, right? So we got a lot of people that have jumped into the business. They've opened up their own shop, um, you know, in the last couple of years. And um, it's become very popular and it's harder to find deals. Anything that's good, uh, the, the opportunity doesn't last. Right. If you wanted to, if you're a Bitcoin investor, I'm not. But if you were, you should have bought it back in 2015, right? When it was like a dollar or something like that. I don't remember what it was, but it was very low at that time. Uh, and then it becomes popular. And then people jump into it. And then the opportunity kind of starts to, to vanish. In storage, it's not completely gone whatsoever, uh, but it is definitely more interesting, more popular. And people are trying to jump into it. And that makes it more difficult to find good deals. Uh, it's month to month. So we said that's a pro, but it's also a con. Uh, because it's month to month, if rents are going down, if somebody builds, let's say, a storage facility nearby and they're coming in with a very really low introductory rate, well, guess what? In order to compete with them uh, to find new tenants, you got to have a bit of a lower rate uh, and you got to lower your rates. So those rates can fluctuate, whereas in multifamily or maybe industrial leasing or retail leasing, you have basically like your rent is set for a year. You know what you're going to get for the next year and you can plan ahead. Uh, whereas in storage, that can change, you know, quarterly. Uh, and then, so it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a stressful time if rents are going down. If rents are going up, that's great. If rents are going down because there's too much competition or just the way the economy is like it is right now, uh, that could be a little drag on your income as well. And then uh, another is a lower actual NOI. So people don't often think about this, but uh, just to use multifamily again as an example, if you have a 1,000 square foot apartment unit that you're renting for a thousand square thousand dollars a month, just as an example, you're basically getting one dollar per foot per month, right? A thousand square feet divided by the thousand dollars in rent, you're getting a, a dollar per foot per month. You can do the same thing in storage. You you have a ten by ten, which is 100 square feet and you rent that for $100 a month, you're also getting $1 per foot uh, in rent. So they can both have the same per foot rent, $1, but $100 is 10 times less than $1,000, right? So you don't make as much money in storage. And I think people, that's that's a bit eye-opening for some people uh, within the space when they start to underwrite and look at deals. Uh, they might look at a um, you know smaller 10,000 square foot deal and realize they're only making, you know, $10,000 if it's fully occupied at a dollar a foot per month. Uh, they're only making $10,000 a month, which sounds like a lot, but then you got to pay your expenses and pay your mortgage. And you actually don't have that much left over. You might have 2000 bucks left over, which could still be a good return based upon how much you invested in the property. Uh, but it is not a very large actual amount of dollars that hit your bank account every month. All right. Whereas in, in multifamily or maybe some other asset classes, the amount of money that you make is actually a bit higher. Your expenses are higher. Your mortgage is more, of course. The price you pay is higher. 
Uh, but often people don't think about this thing, this topic, the lower actual NOI uh, when they get into the business. And lastly, this is a new one for me, uh, online reviews, because they are public forever. So going back to that ECRI uh, thing where they'd have the existing customer rental increases, if you pass through, call it a you know $25 rental rate increase on your customers or your tenants that just moved in, like let's say everybody that moved in the month of December, uh, we're going to hit them with the rate increase here the 1st of April. And so we raise their rents from whatever number by call it 25 to 50 bucks, depending on the size of the unit. About roughly 20, call it 20, 25% of those customers will move out, right? And so that's kind of another con, which I haven't discussed here, but you do have customer or tenant churn every month. You might have 30 people move out in a month and you might have 30 people move in in a month. So you net zero rentals, right? For that month, you you started with a hundred units, for example, you lost 30, you gained 30, you end up at the end of the month with, with hundred units rented still. And you might have them in there at a lower number. So you got to raise those rates later on. Well, when you raise the rates on people, some of them will move out. Some of them will stay. Uh, the people that move out will get upset and they'll usually write a negative review. So if you go to any like facility that does this, maybe public storage or extra space or what I was looking at a deal in the last week or so, went to their website to look at the reviews. And um, that's what you saw. Like these people raised rates, like be careful, bait and switch, you know, it's like the title. And then they, they'll say like, you move in for cheap, but then they get you like in three to six months or whatever. And that's why I'm moving out. If I could give zero stars, I would. So one star for these guys. And that happens across the board. I think it's not good. It's not good because you're going to create a perception that storage is like bait and switch, even though it's not completely true. The customer doesn't care. The tenant doesn't care. All they know is they got hit with the, you know, an increase in their rent within three months. And now they have to move out because they can't afford it. So uh, it does happen. And uh, they'll leave bad reviews and those reviews are there forever. You can always answer the reviews and respond, which I recommend you do. Uh, but sometimes that doesn't do enough. You know, uh, it is what it is. So you got to try to kind of bury, quote unquote, bury those, re those negative reviews with a lot of positive reviews, hopefully positive reviews from your existing tenants. Uh, but anyway, so that's that, guys. We covered uh, the overview of the storage industry. So we talked about uh, just like the opportunity within the mom and pop space. Remember that there's roughly 40% of square footage owned by mom and pops, but that equates to roughly 70-ish percent of actual locations. And the mom and pops tend to be smaller, that class C type property. We talked about the different types of self-storage, class A, B, and C, and the opportunity there in the class you know, B slash C space with the mom and pops. Uh, and then the pros and cons, we, we talked about that. Um, and I obviously just went through all that stuff, so I won't rehash that. But to keep those in mind, you know, if you're looking to jump into self-storage, if you're looking to invest in self-storage with somebody uh, like us or anybody else, you want to keep that in mind too, that we have a balanced view of the space, that we're not all just gung-ho about it because we understand. And obviously you as a listener or a watcher understand uh, the cons and the downsides and kind of can mitigate some of those risks jumping in and when you jump into the space. All right. So that's that guys. Uh, Q and a time. If you have any questions, uh, if you have any questions or whatever, please let me know, drop those in the chat. Let me, I'm going to switch over to, so let me ask this real quick. Hold on. Sorry. Let me, uh, get back to, Zoom is kind of weird sometimes. I'm going to escape from that. I'm going to come back to this. There it is. Uh, so could you guys... I'll have to double check, but somebody said in the chat that you guys couldn't see the presentation the entire time. Maybe uh, I was sharing the wrong one because I actually had slides that I went through and I thought I shared the right one. But uh, if that was the case and it was a mistake on my part, I apologize because I had slides and photos and everything. Showing the different types of... Okay, so Adam says he saw it every time, the whole time. All right, so Kieran, I'm not sure what happened, but hopefully we can uh, make sure it doesn't happen on the next one. All right, so Ron's asking, what are the pros and cons of a self-storage facility located in Opportunity Zone? So we haven't done any Opportunity Zone deals. I have seen some of those come out. Uh, some Opportunity... I, when I've looked at them in the past, uh, the, it's there's an Opportunity Zone there for a reason, and it's because it need, the, you know, the powers that be decided that that area needed some opportunity. And so uh, they said, hey, if you build something here, 
Uh, you'll get some tax credits and some tax breaks, et cetera, which are great. It's a great opportunity uh, for the investor, but usually those areas are not going to be the greatest areas or the greatest locations. What we look for in a uh, location is going to be, whether that's development or existing uh, facilities, I want to see population growth. I want to see decent incomes that can that can cover the rents that we need. Uh, and we want to see, obviously, hopefully very little or no uh, um, uh, development competition nearby. So we want to see uh, high demand and low supply, hopefully. Uh, it's not always the case, but if there's high demand there because people are moving there, then um, that's obviously a good sign. So an opportunity zone will not always check all those boxes, whether it be income or population growth or competition nearby. Sometimes there'll be little competition nearby because of the location, the area, but you might not have the other two where it's going to be uh, decent incomes and um, decent population growth because it's got, again, it's in an up and coming area. Maybe there's some um, redevelopment of some, you know, I don't know, around this area in Charlotte, there's like mill, old mill houses and factories that are being purchased and then redeveloped into apartments uh, or other uses, uh, industrial use, et cetera. So there could be some of that going on nearby. So it really just depends on the location. But that's the problem, I think, with the opportunity zones. Yeah, it's a great opportunity for tax credits, et cetera. But uh, the downsides, the the cons, I guess you'd say, uh, would be maybe sometimes lack of population growth and sometimes lack of decent incomes. So that's what I see. Um, there are probably some other things that I'm missing, but that's that's my personal opinion on it. Any other questions? Let me look. Uh, we covered that one there. Done on that. Cool. I think that's it, guys. This will be part of a uh, series. So I'll be doing, I have 10 for the year. Uh, it'll cover everything from like kind of back of the envelope underwriting to a little bit more in-depth underwriting on metrics. We'll talk about lenders. We'll talk about management. We'll talk about asset management. Um, we'll talk about uh, development. We'll talk about adding units and expanding, et cetera. And that'll run from now to the end uh, through December. So each month we'll be doing uh, more of these. So, um, and it'll just kind of go, go along kind of down the natural uh, path of finding a deal and closing a deal, et cetera. Um, so tune in next. I think the next one is actually the end of this month. Uh, I'll probably share a little schedule of what they look like going forward. Uh, but hopefully that'll help you guys if you want to jump into the business or uh, buy your own deal or invest with somebody um, who is doing a deal, uh, help you kind of get an idea of how this how this whole industry works. Um, and it's all free. And they'll be on YouTube after they're done as well. So Adam's asking, do you raise money from investors for your projects? Yes, we do. Uh, don't want to get into a big pitch for us, but if you want to reach out, Adam, uh, you can please do so. I'm on LinkedIn or Twitter. Connect with me there. Happy to answer any questions you have uh, about deals and projects, et cetera, uh, going forward. All right, guys, let's see if there's no other questions. I am happy to sign off and uh, catch you guys on the next one. Charlie, appreciate it. Thank you so much for tuning in. All right, that's it. I'll catch you guys on the uh, next show, next webinar. Talk to you later.